Hi. Lovely to meet you all. How are you all? Hi. So obviously this is your chance, question and answer with Gerard before we have a good day, so feel free to ask Gerard any questions. Um, before you do, I, I just want to thank you all for coming. Um, it's lovely to see you all in person other than just your Facebook page pages, uh, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real pleasure for me to come here and meet you all in this beautiful part of the world. I mean, you know, this is, uh, this is superb. Uh, I, I went out this morning, got completely lost. <laughs> uh, went out last night, I mean, this was the, the you know, found a pub, of course. And uh, sitting down there having a beer, and there were two women sitting next to me, and uh, another couple sitting on the other, and I hear an Australian accent on my left, and an American accent on my right, and uh, some of you probably know I live in Arizona. The woman on my right was on exactly the same flight from Phoenix to uh, Toronto that I was on because we had this big drama of a guy having a heart attack on the plane, and we thought we were going to be diverted and everything like that. And the other couple on the left um, were from the town that I grew up in, in Sydney. So here I am at Edinburgh, you know, with this small, small world, and uh, meeting, uh, meeting these, uh, these, these people with, uh, you know, they say it's a small world, and it certainly is. So how far have people come? Where have you come, all come from? Well, from here. From here? Here. Here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And? Glasgow. Glasgow and? Cambridge. Cambridge. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and anywhere else? Just outside Glasgow. Just outside Glasgow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Half an hour away. Half an hour away, so you're a local. <laughs> and uh, the accents, the state of saying to somebody, you, uh, you are Scott. You say, no, I'm English, but they came from the border. I mean, they sound exactly the same, so I don't know. <laughs> so who's on the side of independence? <laughs> who, wants to, who wants to break away from England? <laughs> well, it's the march on today because I actually, the train coming from Glasgow to here, yeah. there was three Australians on it from Melbourne, yeah. and the placards, Aussie say, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they were going to the march. Yeah, well, I, I saw them all getting ready this morning when I was walking around. It was, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a colourful time to be here, isn't it? It's great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was the gentleman in your plane up there? The gentleman on plane. Oh, was he was he okay? Yes, he walked out under his own steam, but they had to put the you know defibrillators on him and everything like that. And uh, they were asking whether anybody was um, uh, you know was a trained medical practitioner. And uh, I, I have first aid and um, and CPR, but you know you. you you're certainly not a medical practitioner, so you don't want to be, but you are licensed. I don't know whether you know in America, it's you know, sort of, everyone gets sued, you know, if you, if you trip yeah. over a pavement or something like that, it's always somebody else's fault. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if, if you do administer uh, some um, medical assistance to somebody and it doesn't work out, the family can sue you. So people are not, you know, really reluctant to, to do what, you know, a, normal human being would try to do if somebody found themselves in, uh, in difficulty. Um, so you've got all these laws and you have to be, to, to, to administer some form of uh, first aid or CPR, um, you're, um, you're supposed to have a certificate, you have to be, um, have had training and you have to be able to sign off, you know, if you know how to do CPR and, uh, and first aid and all those things. Thank you. All right, so we've got prisoner questions. How did you first hear about the job? Prisoner, right, okay. Well, I know this sounds very snobbish, but um, I work in the theatre almost. I've done some television. I've done, I've done a wonderful um, co-production between Yorkshire Television and Australia called uh, Luke's Kingdom. Now, I don't know whether it's ever like it was shown over here, I know that. Yeah. But this was in 1974, 73, 74. Uh, I'd done a couple of movie roles, but the thought that the Luke's Kingdom was made like a movie. It had a lot of money spent on it. It had real sets where the walls didn't shake. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, it, it was uh, it had directors like uh, uh, Peter Weir. I don't know if you know Peter Weir's work. He's been one of the top world directors, but this is when he was a young younger man. Um, he made Picnic and Hanging Rock and he made, um, you know, he's, he's extremely well known. So it was a very prestigious television series 
And I've done lots of guest roles in um, series television for Crawford Productions, you know, all of their um, uh, cop shows. And I was always the baddie. You know. It had something to do with the fact that I had acne scars. I think that was the reason. I did. Anyone, <laughs> anyone with acne scars has to be a bad guy. You know, so, you know, Richard Burton had you know, acne scars, so what the heck. But all the stars these days are also pretty, aren't they? They're also smooth skin. And it's all the drugs they take now to get rid of acne. But anyway, so I was always the baddie, and I've done a lot of theatre work where acne, acne stars, scars don't matter at all because they can't see them from that far away. And uh, I've worked in the uh, theatre companies in Sydney and Melbourne. And one day I went along to the bank manager, and um, you know, I was uh, at that stage buying a house. and. Um, I was wanting uh, a little bit more money to do some renovations. And uh, he said, yeah, he said, look, I know you're an actor. He said, but I've never heard of you. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you know, you never go to the damn theatre. That's why, you know, you never see. And being a theatre actor, of course, was, you know, sort of rather grand. And um, so many of my colleagues had, uh, female colleagues, had started working in prison. And when I heard about it, it you know, it, nothing had happened in terms of its popularity at all. It was still experimental. I think they did like the first <coughs> few episodes, the ones with Carol Burns in it, were done one hour a week. And then the idea was that they were going to strip it, so they'd do it two hours a week. And to my mind, that sort of made it into a soap opera. Um, and um, as such, you know, it wasn't very prestigious. I know they weren't going to be spending that much money on it. But after that bank manager said, I've never heard of you, I said, well, I'd better do something where people know who I am, you know, that, that might help with my finances. Um, and uh, uh, Ian Bradley, the producer of it, uh, he was married to Annie Lucas, or is married to Annie Lucas, they still are. And uh, Annie and I had done a play together, and we'd toured Victoria and New South Wales with her. And I knew uh, Ian quite well. Um, do you know who Ian Bradley is? Mm -hmm. He is part of the, the legend of, uh, mm -hmm. of prisoner. Well, when I knew him, he was a gambler and a bookkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> and he used to live in this house called um, uh, Muttering Heights with uh, a few other fairly well-known actors who spent most of their time, uh, their lives, inebriated. Um, and he lived, he lived amongst this group. And uh, next thing I know, he, through Andrew's influence, he starts getting into writing and producing. And I heard that he was uh, doing this, this, this show called Prisoner. And uh, so I went, well, I was having lunch with Annie, and uh, I said, what's, what's this Prisoner show all about? She said, look, I think it's going to be really good. And, you know, you know people like Ellie Valentine had signed up for it, and uh, she'd worked at the Melbourne Theatre Company. Sheila Florence, you know, who was a legend even then in theatre circles, you know, let alone on television. And uh, I thought, well, this might be fun. I'll go along and see what's going on. And um, they'd offered, I went and saw and I saw um, the other uh, producers, I can't remember who the other producers were actually, but um, <coughs> a couple of English guys. You probably know them more than I would. Anyway, um, uh, they met with me. They said, yeah, look, you know, we're looking for a male presence in the, uh, in a, in the rather than just the peripheral characters like the doctors and you know, husbands that are outside, <coughs> and we want someone, a male character inside the prison. And uh, so I thought, okay, I'll give it a try. And uh, the first uh, episodes that they, uh, scripts they gave me, um, I, I didn't think that the character was particularly believable. And uh, especially his so-called uh, Vietnam experiences. Now, I don't know whether you remember the scene with uh, uh, Fiona, when I tell her what happened to me in uh, in Vietnam, I, I wrote that with along with um, a friend of mine who was a Vietnam vet. It was a very very different story, and the story about the little kid that, that I, I shot and killed that I thought he had a hand grenade that was actually a real story, mm -hmm. and uh, it happened to uh, to a friend of mine, and he said and the reason that he shot this little kid is because these little kids were doing that, throwing hand grenades at him. And uh, so um, that, to me, gave it some, some, something that I could personally relate to, that I could personally um, feel strongly about. And, um, you know, the rest, as they say, is prisoner history. 
but uh, that, that's how I heard about it. And uh, after that, the bank manager did know who I was. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you leave? I got sacked. Oh. <laughs> I, I had a I had a run in with the new producer in in I wasn't in the Um it was a combination of things. I was desperate to get back into the theatre and I was misbehaving a bit, I admitted that. There was a stage where I'd get a script, I'd read it once, and I knew exactly what I had to say, you know, move along, you know, whatever, you know, there were so many cliches that I was given, and I was talking to the writers, and I said, you know, give us some meat, you know, I'm an actor, I want to be more than just ushering people from place to place, and they did that for a while, but uh, this new producer that came in, um, I just don't think he, he liked me, I think there was something, something going on, and... Um, They'd run out of storyline ideas, and um, when it, and and also because I was one along with um, with Val Lehman, I was one of the uh, the cast members that really agitated for us to get better pay uh, because we were being paid practically nothing. Um, they had this crazy system where they broke the week's work up into half-hour lots. If you're in two half-hour lots, you get paid half as much as the people that did four. Was. And um, the writers were getting very clever, and they were making sure that we, <laughs> at the most, only ever appeared in three of the four. So that, our, and um, sometimes it only you only get paid for one. So Val and I got the cast together, and the cast were not very keen to take on the management because Grundy's were notorious for sacking a whole cast. They'd done that with a, um, a uh, uh, the cast of the show up here. Uh, these, these kids here are from the show called The Restless Years. Uh, no, this, was it The Restless Years? But I think they might have changed it. I think that was The Restless Years, and that was Peter Mockery and uh, And um, uh, they got together as a cast and said, you know, we want to be paid better. And so they sacked the whole cast. So a lot of these prisoner girls, you know, they, uh, like Val, hadn't worked professionally very much at all. And they were terrified of losing their job because they knew how, how, um, how nasty um, Chinese could be. But, you know, uh, to me it didn't make sense that they'd do that. I said, what are they going to do, blow up the whole prison? Are they going to wipe out everybody? I said, as long as everyone sticks together, we'll be okay. And those of us that were regulars, we eventually got a three-episode guarantee. They didn't put our uh, rates up at all. It just meant that we got more, you know, more of the pie. After I left, I think they did a lot better than that in you know, the three bars installation. So, but for whatever reason, they thought that, that I was the main instigator of this. So I had a bit of a reputation back then. You know. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I like the cause, <laughs> And uh, so I think that I, I bought the brunt of that. And um, so they left it. And, and, uh, what I didn't appreciate, that it was such a wimpy ending, I just sort of left, you know. There was no big, big, you know, episode to get rid of me or anything like that, you know. I thought, they, they said, we said, oh, we just turned out because we might want to bring you back later. Well, they never invited me back. <laughs> what was it like working with, um, what's his name? Wayne Jarrett? I never worked with him. I don't think we were ever in the same year, so... Uh, the Sunday efforts? Right. We worked with them. Okay. Well, see, I think you remember that. I, I, I... They were good episodes. They were good episodes? I think that's yeah. where your pictures from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Got it. Did yeah. <laughs> all my own stunts, too. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did that in those days. But Wayne, Wayne was a nice boy. I mean, I knew him socially, but I can't actually remember whether we had... We had a couple of scenes together, but um, and I, 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 I left the episode. I didn't even know that he died until somebody told me. Like, might have been even a year after that, and it was quite a shock. And I went, "What? No, he's too young to die. No, that's not. That's not happening." But uh, he was a very, very nice man. Good man. But the other guys, you know, that we, we had in there, they were, um, 
that was fun to work with. But um, you know, I, I was the only only bloke down there with the girls for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, getting back to your question before, you know, I, I knew it was time to leave when I had monthly cramps. <laughs> and I, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> what brings you to the UK? You guys. <laughs> Coming to see you guys, you know. I, I was very bad um, at answering fan letters, and I was, uh, I was telling Alan here before the reason why. I'll tell you how mean our employees were, employers were. Um, when we started getting fan letters, you know, we <coughs> signed our cards. Uh, we didn't even have any fan cards to start with. They, they weren't. Channel Ten didn't believe in the show ever. I think probably by the time it got to the fifth year or something, they, they thought, "Oh well, we, we never, we never got the, the, the covers of the TV weeks and anything like that." To get that cover, it took an enormous amount of pressure from the uh, from the publicity department. It was all these pretty young things that always got the covers. You know, we never did. You know, we were considered you know, the, the plain people of TV, and. Um, so, um, I just lost my train of thought here. I was just thinking about all those pretty girls. Um, <laughs> fan cards. Fan cards, that's right, yeah. Um, so, eventually we got the fan cards printed, but we were writing um, thank yous to the fans that wrote in and putting them in the, in the post, and they would post them, and eventually Channel 10 said to them, said to us, we were going to have to pay for our own postage. Now, not that it was a big deal, but it was the principle of the thing. <coughs> And I said, no, I'm not doing that. And so for years, you know, I, I never answered any of, the, any of the fans. And it's probably one of the reasons that the, you know, the professional autograph hunters are sort of keen to get my, my autograph, because there are so few of them out there. Um, the others, like Sheila, was always good at answering. Um, Val was always good at answering, but, but I wasn't. I, was, uh, I regret that, because I, re I, I, I realise now that this meant a lot to the people that were writing in. And, um, you know, one of the few benefits of, you know, getting to my rather advanced age is that, you know, you do gain a bit of wisdom. And uh, there's, there's nothing you can do about your past that's gone. You, know, you might be able to apologise for something you behave with, but that's about it. Uh, you can't change it. But looking back on it, you know, I do regret it because I understand how much it means to people now. I didn't at the time. In fact, I didn't know how popular it was because uh, after I left the show, nothing much was happening in terms of, you know, fan following until it took off in the UK. And then I heard about people, you know, going over here for events like Bug Please, but, you know, and I thought, I'd be kidding, you know, really? And uh, I moved to the States by then, so it was hard for people to find me. Oh, it didn't stop one person from finding it. I was going to ask if you were going to tell that story. You want me to tell I think you should, because I think it's quite funny. Now, this is not to put, put fans down, believe me. You know, all of these handsome movie stars, they have stalkers. <laughs> <laughs> My stalker was blind. <laughs> <laughs> Which might, might tell you something. <laughs> Um, but she was, um, I might mention her name, because some of you might even know her, I don't know, she's, she's Australian. But she was, now this is pre-internet days, don't forget. She, um, she was one of the people that I probably didn't answer her fan letter. And so she started to get more and more obsessed about it. And um, she taught computer skills to the blind. That was her job. And she was extremely clever. Now, I got a little bit confused when I was talking to Alan about the time frame, because a lot of it happened when I went to the States and then came back to Australia and then went back to the States again. But during this process, um, she became a real pest and um, found my phone numbers twice, even though I had a silent number, and would ring. And initially I'd talk and I'd say, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, 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 talk to you later, hang up. Um, so I'd gone, yes, I'd gone to the States. I'd worked over in, in Hollywood for, um, from 95, back to 2088 until 95. And um, 
then came back to Australia, and that's that's when all of this chaos started happening. So I'm getting the timeline set now. Aren't I? So now I'm living back in Sydney with my new wife, American woman, and um, Debbie Cook starts. Oh, I mentioned her name, didn't I? Uh, starts. It's a different Debbie Cook. There's a Debbie Cook on our fan pages, but it's not the same one. Um, because this person isn't. This Debbie Cook isn't blind. She's again found my silent number in in uh, in Sydney, and by this stage, um, I'd uh, written uh, the movie Gross Misconduct, and she now started to tell me that she was. Uh, now a writer, and she wanted me to look at some of her scripts. And I get these treatments for a script, which were really scary. In it, there's this blind woman who falls in love with this guy because of his voice. She didn't see me, so she didn't notice her. This guy that she falls in love with um, has an ex-wife and a daughter and has a new American wife. In the process of these treatments, the ex-wife and daughter get killed in a car crash, and the new wife burns to death when her house catches fire. Excuse me. <laughs> leaving the guy free to hook up with the blind girl. This stage, I'm getting very scared. And eventually we get a, um, uh, get a restraining order saying that she can't come. And she came up to Sydney, she lived in Melbourne, came up to Sydney. And um, I'd gone back to the States. And then my wife and I had come back to Australia. And um, at the last minute I was invited to speak at a, a writers conference in Melbourne. And um, <coughs> this is where it gets funny. Um, and I go, to, I go down to the, to, to the, to the writers festival and it was held at a hotel, and was, one of the first events was a garden luncheon up on the roof. And um, I'm getting into the lift with my wife and a couple of other people, and they're talking to me. And just as the lifts are about to close, this white stick appears and stops the, the, the thing, the door from closing. And in gets this blind woman. And I didn't think much of it till I saw her name tag, which said, Debbie, met her before. Never met her. Oh. Debbie Cook. So everyone's now starting to talk to me, and I've seen <laughs> Debbie Cook, and so I'm in there like some demented. <laughs> They're all talking to me. <laughs> so we write, so she's standing right next to me like that, and I'm getting creeped out by the stuff. So I go up to the uh, I go up to the roof and I go up to the organisers and I say, "See that woman over there? She's completely crazy. Do not tell her I'm here." So I have to go down to all the other tables and say, "Don't mention that I'm here." And I'm whispering the whole time I'm there, so that she can't hear my voice. <laughs> but eventually she faded away. So I don't know what's happened to her, but uh, there it is. Did you just switch to RP? To what? RP. Yeah. The synchronization, she would never have recognized your voice, just change the accent. Change the accent, you think I should have done that. No, I think she still recognized it, I think. Her <laughs> hearing is very acute. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And David Cook wasn't the real name, just in case anybody else. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what was it worth like working with uh, Kate Shield? What's she like? Kate, well, I've worked with her many times, so Kate, Kate's. She's, uh, she's quite a character. Um, <laughs> did, did you make the other video? No, I never met her. No. Well, she was. I did a play with her, a David Williamson play called um, uh, A Handful of Friends. And uh, Tommy Oliver, you know, you know Tom Oliver? Yeah. 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 He, was the, uh, he was the other couple. It's a, it's a story about two couples. And uh, she was the other couple, you know, with Tommy Oliver. And uh, so I, I knew her very, very well. I mean, she. There's no way that she could surprise me with anything. <laughs> but um, she always had this rather sort of elegant, um, you know, sort of supercilious, um, superior manner to it, but she wasn't like that at all. <laughs> very down to earth, lovely, lovely girl. I liked her very much. I enjoyed working with her. In fact, I enjoyed working with just about everybody. 
<laughs> Someone's going to ask that question. <laughs> Who did you not enjoy working with? Who did I not enjoy working with? Well, I can honestly say there wasn't anyone that I... That, that I, I there's, some, there's someone, something back there that I thought, no, that person was a pain in the ass, but I can't remember who it was. <laughs> they kind of lasted terribly long, I don't think. But we, we, we all, you know... We basically felt that we were the underdogs all the time. You know, all of it, as I mentioned, the, the, the TV press, they were not interested in us. Um, and uh, they, didn't, they didn't know how to treat us, you know. They, they didn't know how to celebrate prisoner until much, much later on when the fans alone, you know, sort of demanded more uh, coverage for us, you know, in the, in the publicity. And our poor publicity department, I really felt badly for them. So I suppose the only people I didn't like working for was that last producer. He was a real, real pain. New Zealander, that's why I married a New Zealander, so forgive me. But, um, but she was going to ask for a while. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, so he was the only one, and uh, yeah, he was, he was a bit of a pain in the neck. But, but everybody else was, was pretty nice. The production crew were terrific, you know, our camera crew, they were great. Um, and, you know, we had, we had a lot of fun on that set, too, you know. We, you've probably seen some of the bloopers that we set up. And yeah. They, they didn't do all of them, you know. I used to set up quite a few. Did you see the marijuana smoking one? Yes. Yeah. 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 That, was, <laughs> that was just, you know, and the crew went along with it. They just sort of thought that was great. You know, it was just a scene that we actually played. And the only addition was that we were passing a joint around while we were talking about how bad the drug, the drug problem was in the prison. And even Patsy went along with it. <laughs> <laughs> it was very strange seeing Patsy with a joke. And so we did have a lot of fun. But, you know, a lot, a lot of people didn't really know me in that series because I was playing a character which was not very much like me at all. But those of you who have seen the Prisoner in Concert stuff, that's me. Yeah, that's me. That's, uh, I've done musicals before, I've done... Uh, a lot of stage work and um, you know, getting that concert together was great fun. I mean, we really had a good time doing that. Channel 10 had a fabulous band, you know, that was playing this. They played the, the, we used the, uh, the nightclub band, uh, the, the, night, you know, the late show, variety show band, who were just full of some of the best musicians in Melbourne. It was great. What, what? I don't know what idea it was. Um, I think it was something that sort of just eventuated that we thought, you know, we wanted to go to a women's prison, but they wouldn't let us. And um, we were saying, you know, can't we give something back, you know, can't we do something? And, uh, and someone suggested, well, why don't we put on an entertainment? It was probably the uh, Colette that probably had the, the idea, because, you know, Colette, the whole time, she and Betty Bobber wrote it. Betty did most of the writing of it, um, and uh, Colette and, and Betty uh, selected the songs. Um, and Colette was always working um, the clubs or working in a variety show, and uh, she and Betty and another uh, very nice singer um, had a, a sort of an Andrews Sisters um, uh, act that they did. Uh, very fine singers, beautiful close harmonies and all that. And, uh, in fact, uh, my, my ex-wife hired uh, Colette to take the uh, dance program. Um, my wife was running a, 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 the performing arts faculty of a private school and um, she was teaching drama and she got uh, Colette to come in to work with the kids. Um, and she choreographed uh, some of the, uh, the special events that this school did. We have a big thing called the Rock of Stedford where these uh, high school kids take a, either do a, a mash-up like they do on Glee um, and do dance routines to them and the, all these schools compete. Well, she and Colette put together this all-girls school, which was really hard for them to even get to the finals, but they, they were runners-up twice and they won it one year with Colette um, doing a lot of the choreography. So uh, it was probably her idea and uh, Betty Bobbitt's. And, uh, yeah, Betty was always, she was such fun. 
And I've worked with her in the theatre many times too. Yeah. All part of the Melbourne Theatre Company click. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I know it was a long time ago. Are you still in touch with anyone you work with? On Facebook, we are now, yeah. But I did, you know, li living in the States, I did lose, um, lose track, of, track of people. <coughs> it wasn't until Val invited me over to the event that we had in Birmingham that, um, you know, that I'd seen, uh, that I'd seen uh, Fiona again. And uh, I was very, very sad to hear that uh, her partner, uh, Denise, had died. That was. Because you know, they were such a great couple, you know, beautiful people. I, I get so upset with the anti-gay movement in uh, in America. You know, against gay marriage. You know, I've got so many friends. I've got um, a good friend of mine, Jonathan Hardy. I don't know whether you know Jonathan from Australia. Um, very good actor. Um, he he wrote uh, Breaker Morant. Worked with me in the Melbourne Theatre Company. Well, he and David had been a couple for like 26, 27 years. And uh, Jonathan died last year, and I just heard from David that he was spreading Jonathan's ashes on their garden. And uh, Jonathan and I, you know, we'd gone out and gone fishing together, and he was always the most outrageous gay flirt of all time. You know? <laughs> he was always saying to me, God, Jerry, you know you're gay, you know you're gay. <laughs> I'm not, but you know, we did that. But uh, he, was, uh, he was a very funny man. And uh, one of the longest surviving heart transplant uh, people, he, he was nearly dead at the time we were doing prisoner, and um, he got a heart transplant, you know, 30, he got an extra 35 years, he was about to die when he got his transplant. And they were a model couple, really were. And my good friend, uh, um, now Craig Savidra, and uh, his partner, he's the, um, uh, the DP, the Director of Photography on Glee. They've been together. They've brought up a, a boy together. They initially fostered this kid from a, you know, a very poor circumstances in Los Angeles. And this young man, he's straight. You know, you're either gay or you're not. You know, it's not environmental. You're not forced to be one thing or another. And um, he, uh, he's now um, graduated from high school, and they've been together. Brought up this young man beautifully. And all of these people, you know, these southern, um, you know, anti-gay people in America are saying. Gay teachers in school are going to somehow, you know, convert <coughs> people. You know, it's such a ridiculous argument, and I just wish I could, you know, give these people as examples of how wrong they are. But they really are wrong. Yeah, they're on the wrong side of history too. Yeah. That's my little message for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Recently wrote her, her book, yes. which is wonderful, I have to say. Oh, good, I'll have to read it. Right? You must, I don't know yeah. if anyone else would read it, yeah. but it's absolutely Perfect. fantastic. Yeah. Would you ever consider doing the same? Writing a book? Yeah. Yes, except I, I'm a little bit icy, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little bit, um, what do you call it, uh, when you can't concentrate for very long. So I can write a movie script because they're short. <laughs> I've, I've started writing, um, I'm about a third of the way through about eight books at the moment. <laughs> but yes, I, 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 I would, but you know, my memories of Prisoner, which I suppose would be the main selling point, aren't, aren't that strong. But it's surprising how many of our Prisoner cast went into writing too. I think Colette writes, you know, she? She writes, you know, she's written some books, and so has um, Jane. Jane, Jane, yeah, she writes uh, thrillers, yeah. And, uh, you know, I've, I've written three movie scripts that have been made, and I've written a lot more that weren't made. But um, that was just a... It, one, one of the things that happened after I left Prisoner is that it was extremely hard for me to, uh, to get work again. Because in television I've been typecast, and the theatre company that I most worked with, the Melbourne Theatre Company, were very snobbish now. And they were saying, oh no, you're a television actor. They're very different now, you know, if you've got any sort of publicity, they want you. But back then, it was you were either a theatre actor or you worked in television. You know, so it, was, it was hard. And so writing became a, an offshoot of, um, of being bored and not getting the work that I wanted to get. I was still getting plenty of work, mainly doing uh, uh, voiceover commercials. 
doing very well that way, but you know that wasn't satisfying really. And so that's when when I started the idea of you know I, I thought I'd produce, be a producer, and uh, optioned a book. Uh, at the time, I came over to London with a play called Sons of Cain, and uh, we were playing in the West End. And on the plane, I'd read this book that I really liked. And uh, when I got back to uh, Sydney, you know, I optioned the book, uh, and the novelist that wrote it wanted to write the script and I thought, oh, well, that makes sense. I didn't realise that that's a trap, you never want to go there. Because, you know, novelists have got a totally different mindset from movie writers. The thing that, and I've done it twice now, for, for most three times now I've done it, working with the writers of the original material. And the first thing I say to them, I said, you know, you've got to remember that in a film script, or a television script, it's only what the characters say and only what you see them do that should be in your script. Don't put in what they're thinking. Because you can't, you know, what are you going to do? Voiceovers, maybe? You could have a voiceover, I'm thinking this. It's sort of a bit boring. So they've got, to tra they've, got to, they've got to really adjust it. And no matter how many times that you tell them, they come up with things like, um, Jim runs from the hut. This is actually a line in one of the scripts this guy wrote. Jim runs from the hut at the hut. He looks to the right, looks to the left. So far the writer is following instructions. He's looking to the right and looking to the left. Deciding that the left is the obvious way to go, he runs to the right. So I said to him, I said, how do we know that when he looks to the left, that's the obvious way to go? He says, well, it is. And I said, but how do we know that? You haven't written it. I mean, is there like um, heavy shrubs that way? And that would be the way you'd go if you wanted to hide? You know, what, what do we see here? And, and all of these things were, um, you know, you have to translate to, 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 to writers. And this is a bit esoteric, I know, but um, the great Japanese <coughs> film director, Kurosawa, Kurosawa, he had a line in the script that his writer had given him which said, the crow flies lazily home to its roost. And Kurosawa said to his writer, he said, well, you know, you're using language beautifully here. You've got a poetic image. <coughs> crow flying lazily home, roost. These are all words that elicit certain feelings. But what you have to realise that what you've given me to shoot is the shot of a crow flying. None of those other emotional words are there. Home, roost, crows always fly the same way. Flying lazily, you know. So if you can tell me why a shot of a crow flying has the same emotional meaning as the crow flies lazily home to its roost, if you can explain to me why that's so, I'll keep it in, otherwise it's out. But that's the sort of thing that a, that a, that a, a novelist has to, has to realise. And, and coming from a, uh, a, a theatre background, to me the dialogue and the words were all important. What was said, because I never used to read that stuff in the scripts, because it was always off-putting. You know, what's my bit? Their bits, thank you, about their bits. What's my bit? <laughs> you know, so you get pretty used to, you know, using dialogue as your main um, uh, focus of the uh, moving the script forward. So there's a little lesson in writing scripts. <laughs> <laughs> I was speaking to Coral Drone a mm -hmm. couple minutes ago, yeah. and she was saying that sometimes you would add your own little bits of dialogue oh, yes. and you try and put it into the camera, uh, put it in, and the cameras are rolling, and yeah. <clears throat> you try and onto your ways, yes. you were saying things, and she says, Jerry was always good at that. <laughs> That's there, was nice, a, there was a scene, um, and it, Colin mentioned it, and it was when, who was it? Doreen had put a bucket full of silver powder on top of the cell door, yeah. and vinegar tits yeah. had come through, yeah. and it went all over her. In, and you brought her to the governor's office, and Erica had said, a bucket full of soap powder all over her. And apparently, 
Carl said she was off camera, but you were trying your best not to laugh. The whole scene was ridiculous because everybody was putting their own bits into it, and you tried your best not to laugh the whole way through. But was there a lot of moments like that? Yes. <laughs> I think it was best summed up again. It's in the group text on there when uh, when um, Elspeth said, "You know, what a ridiculous way to make a living." Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of the times, you know, when you do your best to do this, you know, the acting thing they say, the suspension of disbelief. Um, you know that that you you throw yourself into it. You believe what's happening and what you're supposed to say. But sometimes, you know, just your intellect takes over, and you say. What? <laughs> um, so yeah, you've got to avoid that. You know, you, you you can't judge your character. You know, you've got to be your character. But um, yeah, we used to we used to have a bit of fun. It, the, the the governor's office was always that thing that we we were nervous about because <laughs> because Patsy, you know, she was so precise with what she had to say, you know. And sometimes she'd get tongue-tied and, the, you know, we'd... we'd um, sometimes those scenes would take a long, a long time to put, put down. We got very glib, you know. Uh, as I, I, I didn't finish up my thought before, I was saying one of the reasons that, that, that I left is that, you know, there, there was one moment where I was going up to the floor having only just glanced at the script. We were just going up for our preliminary blocking, and usually you learn your lines after you did the blocking. And um, Fiona, who was always very good at studying her scripts and knowing the lines before we did the blocking, uh, she started feeding me my lines. Sorry. That's a lot of Surely that's easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Goldfinger. She was pretty good on the Oscars, wasn't she? At her ripe old age, when yeah. she was saying gold mm -hmm. again. Um, so Fiona started uh, feeding uh, her, her lines to me, and not really having read the script even, I started answering her. And I think I only got one line, line partially wrong. And that's when I thought, this has become too predictable. And that was when I started to sort of distance myself from the show, and I think that probably led to me being fired. My attitude it wasn't good. <laughs> was was there anyone else that get fired? Oh yeah, yeah. I think so. I think so. Who, who else? I can't remember any. I, you know, when I say I was fired, I suppose that's not really fair. They just didn't renew, renew the contract. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are other people that didn't renew. I think Colette eventually. I think. Uh, I mean, I think Val said that. Yeah. Yeah. She just moved out. She moved out. Yeah. Oh, well, she's yeah. funny. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, she is. Another modern theatre company girl. Yeah. yeah. They're all little, you know, poetry of theatre actors. Well, who did you do your theatre training actually with him? Uh, no, uh, the National Institute of Dramatic Art, neither. That's where you know we've produced so many. A lot of the big stars in Hollywood now are Australian actors. You know, the guy that's um, what's his name, Helm Helmsworth, that plays. Chris Hemsworth. Yeah. Yeah. He's Australian. Yeah. He was trained at NIDA, I believe. Came from Home and Away. Yeah. Home and Away. Yeah. yeah. These kids from Home and Away, they're getting their start there, and then they're coming over to America, and they're getting cast like that. So many of them. So yeah. many. Yeah. yeah. A lot. Yeah. And uh, Rose Byrne, she was. Um, my wife actually cast her in the, uh, her first movie, wonderful film she did with uh, Heath Ledger called uh, uh, Two Hands. Ooh. And I cast Heath uh, when he was virtually unknown too. I did a spin-off from Gross Misconduct, uh, a pilot for a TV comedy using the lawyer from Gross Misconduct. And uh, we, we cast Heath, he appears in one shot at the end in the booth of the pilot. And uh, yeah. But, but, but when I was, there were very few Australian actors that came over to the States to try and break in during my period. And uh, it was only the, the pretty ones that tried to do that, you know, the, the good looking guys. Uh, it was a much more local thing now, wasn't it? Yeah. Now everyone comes up. Yeah. 
you know, I'd love, love to go on some, some of the actors' pages uh, in Australia, and uh, they're talking about getting advice about how to get visas to the States and all that sort of thing. And it's, a, it's not easy, it's hard, but um, the casting directors, they love the young Australians. They, they think, one, they're well trained. Um, they're easy to get on with. They don't pull star stunts like a lot of the Hollywood actors do. They're very serious about their work. Usually they're not into the drugs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and everyone uses Hugh Jackman as the model. Mm -hmm. Because you know, Hugh is the sweetest man in the world. Yeah. He's, just, he's just no hassle. Every actor that works with him. His wife is a good friend of mine, and uh, I don't know Hugh at all, but I know, I know his wife there. And uh, they're really finesse. Older than he is, by quite a few years. She was in prison as well. Yeah, she was in prison for a bit, and um, she uh, was also in the, in the play you know, that my wife produced in uh, Los Angeles, uh, working with Ed Harris, a play, a play called Scar. And uh, she was funny, she was so intimidated by Ed Harris. It's the, you know, the best theatre actor I've ever seen. You know, he's great on film, but if anybody get a chance to see Ed Harris in theatre, he is phenomenal. He can hold his own with, with any of the great English actors. He's got a fabulous voice, well produced. Because what's happening on Broadway now, and, and probably on the West End too, everything now is mic'd. You don't have people like the, like the, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, the great English actors, like, you know, what's his name, uh, Stuart, um, you know, from Star Trek and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, not the voice that can fill it up, you know, they, they don't have it. And, and my training was that, you know, uh, when, when I was playing at Wyndham's, you know, we weren't mic'd. People sitting in the back rows never had any problem hearing us. Yet you go to Broadway now and all of these people, like, you know, my favourite actress of all time, Scarlett Johansson, um, she's now mic'd, they're all mic'd, you know, so they don't have to have voices anymore. And the, the American actors aren't trained that way. English actors are. Australian actors are. And I think, you know, even when you're filming, that, that, that helps. Because, you know, getting sound, getting good quality voice on, onto the film, even though the, the recording techniques are very, very sensitive, um, that makes people want to work with you again. If you make it easy on the crew and you're not wasting time. It's expensive to film. Anything else? Have I exhausted you? <laughs> <laughs> How long does it take to shoot? Um, there's one storyline that I love, and that's when parts get shot. Um, how long does it take? Uh, there's another thing as well. Whenever there's riots and the riot alarm was going off during the Sunday Edward stage, did you hear? The riot alarm, or was that edited in, or the fires and things were they real or? Some of the fires were real. I mean, you have to be very, very careful with it, and we weren't that as careful as they are now. Um, that was still at the stage where we were still doing our own stunts. We were just getting into the safety of having <coughs> stunt coordinators and safety coordinators on set. Um, we had. I'm, I'm about to head off into, you know, a, an avenue of telling you stories that aren't related to prison, <laughs> but they sort of are, and that is uh, how we came to have uh, safety coordinators. The fire once I know we had somebody there and we had a fire marshal there. I can remember that because, uh, and I can remember that at one stage they used something that nearly choked us, nearly killed us. They used some something that produced a lot of smoke that was probably carcinogenic for all we know, but we had to stop that. That was a, that was a hard one. <coughs> but um, in the days, do any of you know the, about the Crawford's years, the Crawford productions, the cop shows that were being done, all of these uh, cop shows that were shot, were shot out of Melbourne by Crawford Productions, they, they used to, <coughs> they, they started doing, Crawford started off as producing radio drama and they eventually get into television drama, and they had shows like uh, Cop Shop, uh, Division 4, Homicide, uh, Bluey, um, and before I went into prison and while I was still living in Sydney, they'd fly me down to play the baddies, you know, someone, you know, 
raping people, you know, beating people up, you know, I was doing all sorts of horrible things. Um, and I'd often do like two or three shows back to back, because that way they could say one half theirs, and you know, I'd go from one show to the next, you know, uh, playing guest roles. And a lot of the stuff that I did was dangerous. Uh, bike stunts, motorbike, and they, that was good, you know, because, you know, that was, <laughs> I'd say to them, I said, look, I know I'm going to be riding a motorbike, so why don't I just pick the motorbike up, and then I've got transport the whole time in Melbourne. <laughs> and so I'd go down, and they'd say, oh, sure, you take care of the bike, and you get it on set, and all that. And I know Alan worries because of the bike, and go, you know, I sometimes turn up a little late, but when I got the motorbike, I'd do it sometimes. <laughs> so they, they, thought, they thought I was pretty good at that. Um, but, uh, we would do our own motorbike stunts, we'd drive the cars, you know, for these high-speed chases. And uh, Grigor Taylor, a very fine actor, working on this uh, other show, I think it was called, I think it was Louis that he was working on. Um, they set up for a car chase on one of these back roads out of Melbourne. <coughs> and they set the camera crew, so you can imagine where you're sitting over here, is um, like uh, uh, the curb in the road. And where your camera is, is the camera that they were shooting. Right behind you would have been the bank behind the road. And uh, the shot was, you know, the guy that they were chasing would come around the corner like that, and they'd do that shot first, and then they'd shoot the cop car coming around after it. Grigor driving the car. The director wanting more speed, more dirt coming up from the road. Grigor loses control of the car. It smashes up against the camera and kills the camera. Grigor never recovered from that. That finally convinced Crawfords that we should have professional stunt people. Um, I probably got, had permanent damage from one that they did for me in an episode uh, called Violent Thursday, um, where we were this, um, uh, this group of um, uh, bank robbers. Uh, and eventually I get shot by one of my own gang with a shotgun. And um, the sound recorders had taken a, uh, a special effects course. And so he was eager to try out the sort of Sam Peckinpah, bam, you know, let's get blood coming everywhere. And uh, what he rigged up was uh, the bell of a bicycle, you know, a steel bell like that. And he put the, um, the squibs inside the steel bell and then he put a, a plastic um, bag full of blood over that so that it would go <laughs> blood would splatter everywhere. And he put it on my back. And he was being very careful as seeing how it was going. So he first of all tested the thing by putting the squid uh, on this leather belt and the bell sit sitting on, which he rigged up, the bell sitting on the, on the, um, on, on the belt, um, and put it on the thigh and exploded and he said, does that feel okay? I said, yeah, I hardly felt it, no problem at all, good, good, good. Um, and I was wearing a pair of denim work overalls. And so he put the belt on the back right around the kidneys and um, the first two takes, the squib went off right on time, but it didn't blow out the denim and we didn't get the blood effect that he was looking for. So he kept on increasing the size of the squib, the exposure. And he said, oh, just to be on the safe side, I'll put some foam padding between the belt, belt and your back. Now, has anyone done any rifle shooting? Mm -hmm. Anyone done rifle shooting? Well, one of the things you know, if you're shooting a high-powered rifle, you pull it in as tight as you can, because you don't want to give it any room to move and hit you. Mm -hmm. Not thinking about it, this is what he did. So he split this foam, which wasn't a dense foam, it was just this little hollow foam, and this belt behind it, like tripled the size of the squid, and we do the shot, it works brilliantly, blows out the, um, uh, the, the denim, um, and I'm lying on the ground, <coughs> semi-conscious. I wasn't acting. This thing had now all of this, this, this room to travel. And so now this steel bell whams into my kidneys, wins me completely, and down I went. You know, this was, pretty typical of how lax our, 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 our things were. And in those episodes where we did stunts, um, very early on in the season, I don't, I don't remember, there was um, a time where I was trying to stop one of these, these guys from leaving in his truck. That's right. mm -hmm. I nearly died on that. Um, the guy, the actor, 
during the rehearsal, he wasn't supposed to move the vehicle, and we were working out where I was going to fall. So we were doing the rehearsals, I fell down, next thing I feel the wheels of the truck touch my hair as it goes past as he backed out. Holy hell, you know, if he was just off a little slightly, that, that would have gone right over my head. You know, so, there was a lot of dangerous stuff happening until finally they got the, uh, they got the stunt coordinators. So to answer your question, um, I think that the ride bell was something they added in later. But um, some of it they would have had it over our dialogue. If you see it going over the dialogue, then it was probably live. Um, it might have been in the mix, it's hard to know. But uh, all the scaling of the walls and, you know, the, the fight scenes, all of those. I, I, I want to tell you a Jude Curing story, though. This is, this is a bit graphic, so do... You know Jim was supposed to be terrified of blood, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And there's a scene where, you know, she you know, there's this thing, I go all... Mm -hmm. The screen goes, oh, and I get this flashback. When we were rehearsing that, Jim Curing throws me a bloody tampon. Oh. Not real, it was fake blood. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thinking that it was going to freak me out. Now I know Jude, you know, I, I love it very good. So I catch it, I dangle it by the strip string and I start to wheel it around the fingers when we're doing the scene. Now I don't know whether they kept that one. <laughs> but Jude was so disappointed, she thought it was going to freak me out. <laughs> Amanda says she was really funny to you, like she was crazy thing. Well, I mean, she is partially insane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, she did that event in Australia, didn't she? Yeah. She's yeah. very interested in that battle. You know, we, we worked together on the, um, uh, that was a very serious moment in Australian politics where the Governor General sacked the, the Parliament and uh, <coughs> Jude and I did street theatre together, you know, on the campaign, trying to unsuccessfully, um, you know, Bring about a, a later um, election that's going to be failed. But we had a lot of fun doing that street show. So it's a small acting world there, you know, even though all of us didn't, but just about every actress in Australia put in prison at some stage. Right? Yeah. yeah. Is that the, the new book? Yeah, yeah. Is there anything from me in there? I think there's a few bits of comedy from yourself. But I, don't know, I, I, I sent these guys a whole lot of stuff, and I'm just interested in how much yeah, they, they were. Yeah, the, that's pretty bad for them, you know. Yeah, but I didn't you know whether they, they gave any thanks to anybody. I don't know. So I think you're oh, yeah, your name's in the credits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. On that I heard note, nothing from them, actually. Yeah. 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 On that note, I think there'll be some rumbling stomachs. It's 2 o'clock, and the booth is being served. Okay. So is everyone okay? We can still yeah. talk more while we're in there reading. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just there, Rosanna will be here if you want to get any merchandise. You can go back and forward as you please. And remember the photos are just through that door there. So you can just help yourself to the good day because I'm sure everybody's got a lot smaller than last year. Okay. Thanks, guys.